Um, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited uh, not just to be with you this morning, but what we are going to be doing this morning. Uh, if you were here last week, you would remember that we kicked off a two-part series, and so we're, we're wrapping it up today, only two Sundays, um, and, and we've titled it, You Are Not Alone. Uh, we were talking about uh, mental health, right? and we said this, that uh, your mind matters to God. Uh, your mind matters to God. Maybe there's another way to say it, is, is what you think you feel, and what you feel you do, and so therefore it's important uh, for us to kind of uh, figure out what, what are we thinking about? What do we spend most of our times thinking about? What, what, what are we believing up here? Uh, God cares about what you think. God cares about your mind. Uh, we went on to say that, you know, one of the ways that uh, we love God is, is by kind of what we do with our minds and how, how we channel the thoughts that are up here. Uh, because what we think, we feel, and what we feel, we do. And so we unpacked uh, anxiety. We've gone down many pathways, but we decided to talk about anxiety because this is something that every single one of us in here has experienced. Maybe you're experiencing it right now. And, and so uh, if you don't take hold of those thoughts and those feelings, then uh, it'll take you down a path that you don't want to go Two. In fact, God doesn't want you on that path. And so we walked through uh, Philippians and, and looked at the words of Paul. And I'll uh, remind us a little bit of that towards the end. And then what I said last week is that this week we'd have uh, a professional. All right. And, and so while I can kind of walk a journey with you, there are certain places that I cannot go because I do not have that level of expertise. And so uh, there's an individual that I, I know um, actually got connected to him by someone in this church. Thank you very much, ma'am. And, uh, and we've just become really good friends over these last few, I guess, weeks, maybe months. And, uh, and he's a professional. He's a clinical um, psychologist. And so I said to you, we'll have him come up and we'll just uh, chat a little bit. We'll uh, engage a little bit. Um, we'll ask some questions about this area of uh, mental health or mental well-being. Uh, and you guys, are, you're absolutely going to going to love it. It's going to be incredible. He is an incredible human being. Let me just give you, I was going to say a quick bio, um, but, but this man does not have a quick bio, and so get comfortable, all right? <laughs> this morning we have uh, Tabang Chaka, who is a clinical psychologist registered with the Health Professions Council of South Africa, so you know he's legit, all right? This is not a fly-by-night uh, individual. Uh, Tabang has deep and wide experience that includes um, you know, working with communities in Ekuruleni and in Tswane. He's also worked in various hospitals in Tswane. Uh, he's worked at the University of Pretoria and then also uh, has worked with the Defense Force, which I was wondering, um, do you have like a high level of security clearance uh, because, because you've, you've worked with the Defense Force? Is that, is, okay, we'll chat, okay, okay. I might have gone, we might need to cut that out of the recording. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to stay alive. Uh, Tabang has also worked with individuals, uh, families, and a diverse group of uh, people in various provinces uh, and various settings around the country. He holds a master's degree in clinical psychology from uh, the greatest university in the country. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, go Tux. Um, he, 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 no, I'm, I'm going to keep that one in. I, I was going to say something about Cape Town, but I, I, I still love Cape Town. Uh, he was a Mandela Rhodes Scholar in 2008 and uh, Brightest Young Mind Delegate, which is an organization that connects young leaders and equipping them with skills and mindset uh, and uh, networking uh, that is needed to create sustainability uh, across this great continent. Uh, he has been interviewed on various platforms, uh, television, radio, and print. I could list a ton of those, uh, but for the sake of time, I won't. I uh, told you, it's long. Uh, he is an author of several books, all right, it's a big deal, uh, titled The Tax Taxi Philosopher, which is an interesting one, uh, Selfie of the Soul, and uh, Focus and Flourish. Uh, so I'd encourage you maybe to grab some of those. He has developed uh, quite a few uh, programs, uh, training programs, uh, one for couples uh, that might interest you if you are married, uh, and then one for teenagers, so if you have kids in that age group. Um, that one is called Empires of the Mind, so it's really, really cool. Um, I could say more and more and more, but I, I think what's uh, very important to him, what is dear to him, probably what he'd want me to have started with, uh, is this man loves the Lord. Um, he loves his wife, so he's married, so lady, sorry. He's married, uh, loves his wife. He has two incredible kids. 
Um, and then there's one little uh, thing that I thought was pretty cool. Uh, he's also met uh, President Nelson Mandela. Right, right? It was a big deal. Uh, yeah, those of you who didn't say anything, it's because in your heart you're like, I wish I would have met it, but you didn't. <laughs> and he did. So, so that alone, I mean, is enough for him to come sit up here. Um, but having said that, uh, my brother, do you mind coming up? And can we give him a rooted fellowship? Welcome to Tabang. Um, grab a seat here. And uh, good sir, you can grab this mic. There we go. Let's grab a seat um, and l let's chat a little bit. Well, first and foremost, uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you uh, for making time. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. I'm, I'm glad to be here this morning. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. So look, um, how, how long have you been in, in the kind of, I mean, how long have you been a clinical psychologist? Maybe let's just start there. And why did you get into it? Uh, about uh, maybe 15 years, oh, wow. 14, 15, somewhere there. Um, I still wanted to, to study sports psychology. Huh. Right? I wanted to study sports psychology. And my aunt said, why don't you try clinical? Then you can do different things. So then I studied uh, clinical psychology. But I used to like Dr. Phil. Uh, <laughs> I, I, used to, I used to watch Dr. Phil. Cause, but I think when I reflected on it later, it was because people intrigued me. Why huh. do people do what they do? And uh, so I, I always enjoyed watching that and then psychology was up there early. Wow. Yeah. That's, it's always interesting. I love it when, like, just asking people, how did you get into what you got into? Yeah. And the stories are always, always remarkable. That's really cool. Are you, you're a bit of an, a sports kind of fanatic. Is that true or no? Is that a bit of a... I'm not a fanatic. Uh, one, of the, one of my goals uh, was to run the comrades since I was... So I was always uh, in, the, in the school sports team, yes. a sprinter. And... A um, little brag there. Little, uh, <laughs> I hope, I hope you guys yeah, caught then, it. Then I, I, my dream was always to do the comrades, okay. uh, which is the goal next year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Then, uh, yeah so I, that's that's. I, no, I'm, don't clap for that. That's no, no. no. <laughs> yeah, we'll clap afterwards. <laughs> yeah. No, I joke. I joke. It's I just. Cool. I never understand runners. Like, how do you run for so? Like, what do you think about when you run for that long? <laughs> Lots of stuff. You you actually okay. you pray. You okay. Do okay. a lot of praying yeah. when you run. <laughs> That's a great way to keep you quiet, huh? It's like, well, I pray. It's like, well, I can't, I can't say anything against that. Okay, great. Um, but let's, let's jump straight into this. So yes. last week, um, unpacked uh, just mental health and, and that our mind matters to God. Uh, we, we walked through anxiety, walked through some uh, things that uh, as a, a clinical psychologist and many in your profession would kind of uh, talk about, give some, giving symptoms of some of those. So maybe just from your uh, not just expertise, but experience. Uh, what are some of the misconceptions about mental health and, uh, and seeking uh, counseling? Um, it's, it's for, I suppose, weak people. I mean, if you're weak, uh, then you, you go consult uh, a mental health professional. Um, people think that um, it's for a certain kind of people, you know, if you have a budget or if you're a bit more westernized or you're like white, then that's your thing. If you're African, uh, mental health yeah. is, is um, something that's not for you. Uh, people believe that uh, sometimes it's not real. Hmm. Like um, if somebody's depressed, uh, you know, you just snap out of it, you, you get out of it. Um, it's, it's not a real thing. You, hmm. you are making it up. And... Um, and that, uh, that people should uh, sort of, you know, get over what, what they went through. Sometimes it's sort of, especially, it's safe, I can, uh, yeah, I can talk, I'm going to leave now. No, no, <laughs> this is great, great, yeah, 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 yeah. We're not, we, we don't pretend to yeah, perform yeah, yeah. here. Oh, wonderful, right, guys? wonderful. No pretending <clears throat> and performing here. So sometimes, you know, um, I remember when, when I was studying, like, I remember we were, I was studying philosophy at school, mm. and uh, in the philosophy class, I was, I was the, philosophy and psychology, they would, they would sort of, so they, they would criticize, what people believe, it's like they don't think, right? Mm -hmm. And you go to church, and then the pastor would say, you don't need a psychologist, and, a, and I, <laughs> I was thinking, so what's going on here, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you believe, we think that, uh, like, everything is spiritual, like, everything is spiritual, um, which, which is, but we need to qualify that, right? Everything is spiritual, and then so if you're somebody who believes and you love the Lord, you're not going to have mental health challenges. Sure. But sure. then you meet 
uh, uh, ministers, people who mean well, who are struggling. Mm. You know, where people get divorced, people lose their children, and they, they get surprised. But I'm, but, but Lord, I, I, I pray, I do all this, why am I struggling? Mm. And so you get sort of those misconceptions, and sometimes it's just a misunderstanding of what we are really dealing with. Sure, sure, that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, and I think even as, you know, the church, sometimes what we can do is, like you're saying, we can almost neglect uh, what's actually happening physically in, in your mind, in your body, and, and then just say, hey, just, just, just pray it. If you just pray it, it'll be totally fine. And it's like, no, no, no. God works through prayer, but he also works through pills. Yeah. God works through miracles, but he also works through medicine. Um, and so I think those two coming together, um, that's, that's really helpful. And so maybe what, what are some symptoms of, of mental uh, health disorder or mental unhealth? Like, so if we're saying, hey, this happens, yeah. What are some of those symptoms if maybe I'm, I'm unaware that yeah. like, I might be going through some stuff? Yeah. So, uh, so it depends what we are talking about, which uh, mental health disorder. So generally, when we think mental health, we think maybe you know, you're more your mood disorders. But what we want to think about is that there are different categories of, um, say, dis disorders, right? Mm -hmm. You get your anxiety ones, people with post-traumatic stress, anxiety, you, you get that group. You get uh, people with mood disorders, depression, bipolar, these, that group. You get people with personality disorders, which we miss a lot. Oh. Uh, we, we don't understand that we like, but there's nothing wrong, but there's something funny about this relationship, right? So we, we miss that a lot. And there's stuff you can get as children. So first we need to just think about these, uh, <clears throat> sorry, or oh, when people are psychotic, schizophrenia, and, and that group, right? That is easier to see if, if somebody is say delusional, uh, if the person is not rational, we are able to see that one. Mm. Um, the, the other symptoms, and then of course with anxiety, um, it's the way a person is thinking, a person is struggling, there's an upcoming event you are struggling with, or there's a task you need to complete but you are struggling with, so that you can, you can see with that one. Then some of the symptoms when it goes to, when we look at things like depression, sometimes people don't know that they have a problem. Uh, so for example, the criteria says that um, a person has to have a, a, a loss of interest in, in previously enjoyed activities. So mm. all of a sudden, this person doesn't enjoy the things they used to enjoy. Uh, so something, I mean, you, used to, you used to like cricket, and all of a sudden, you're not <laughs> interested in it anymore. And, <laughs> and <laughs> it's, it's, it's too soon, man. It's, it's way too soon. So I, I, I had to. <laughs> so, so sometimes, so it's a loss of interest, yeah. right? And sometimes the low mood, and this is this can be recognized by you mm. or other people. Mm. Changes, changes in so some people, so other people notice that, but you not yourself. Changes in your sleeping pattern, changes in your um, eating patterns, um, the the way you move, the way you relate. Or maybe you are a bit emotional, um, and so a useful way to look at it is like everybody should understand their base. Like I have a baseline. This is this is. This is me when I'm okay. And then to recognize, to have the insight, to know that something has changed. Mm. And so when you're struggling, to, when you're struggling in school, work, um, important areas of your life where you are struggling, then we say that there might be something there that we need to kind of unpack and look mm. at. Mm. That's really helpful. Um, are there any like, practical things, even if it's like maybe two or three, yeah. that, that we can kind of use as evaluation tools? Because because what's the difference between um, we're working really hard at work, it's, yeah. a, it's a really high peak season, um, and I'm really tired, and that's just what it is, yeah. as opposed to like, you know, I think something's not, like I'm not okay, and, and, and I, maybe I need some help. Are there some evaluation tools that we can use, self-evaluation tools maybe? Yeah, I mean, you, you could, but I think a useful way, I think where we should start is everybody should know um, what it feels like to be okay. Sure. To have a base, like this is my baseline. Mm. So to have to know that about yourself, and then when you live a balanced life, then you are able to tell that I'm, I'm now I'm just in a stressful season, or now I'm actually not myself. Something has shifted, and part of why we miss it so too would be we have to live a, a, a balanced life. Most of us don't do that. Mm. We are always rushing and rushing. But a key thing would be when you are struggling to do things that you are ordinarily you are able to do. Uh, then there's then these are these are problem, and of of course there are tests one could download and check, but that, that's not really safe. 
Um, but I'd I'd say for the average person, it would be know uh, what it's like to be um, okay generally, and know when you are struggling to do things that you typically are able to do. Mm. Yeah. So if you if you you know how you work, um, you know what you're able to mm. how when you are productive. Suddenly you are not able to do that same thing. Then then there's a problem there. Yeah. It means you are dealing with more than. Um, the average, um, it's just a stressful season. Sure. Um, so actually the criteria in many of the disorders, it will say um, um, you, you struggle, so there'll be, you'll struggle to perform socially, uh, academically, and other important areas of functioning. If you are, you are struggling to do that, then potentially there's a problem that needs attention. Mm. Yeah. You, you used the word um, balanced. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, this, we could spend so much time talking about that, but, yeah. but, but what is a balanced life? So if, if I'm trying to make sure that like, I'm not finding myself in areas where um, I'm gonna go down a pathway that I don't want to, yeah. um, uh, strive to live a balanced life. Yeah. And, and, and let me maybe make it specific. Like if, as I look across the room, um, I was, I mean, this isn't news to you. These are high capacity, um, highly educated, whether it's formal or informal education. Uh, th these are people that any company would love to hire because they're so incredible at what they do. Um, and so that, that could keep them busy, you know what I mean? And then on top of that, many are married, many have children, many have responsibilities. And so, so what is a balanced life? What do you, what do you mean by that? The, 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 the effect of the matter is that we live now um, in an era where we have a problem of choice, right? Sure. There, there are so many things that a person can do. And so part of what we have to start with is, but what's, what's the point? What's my purpose? What am I supposed to focus on? Mm. At the end of the day, when I'm done, when I look at my life, what is what I'm supposed to have done? So we have to figure out that story. What's the goal? Mm. And then all of us have, say, maybe six areas that if you neglect, any of them is going to affect the other ones. Um, so we have to take care of, so a balanced life, a balanced human being, you, you have an agenda for your physical body. What you eat, when you sleep, how you take care of your body. If, if, if your body is sick, you can't do other things. Mm. Uh, we have to have an agenda for um, uh, spiritually, right? It, you, you could be, I mean, I, I'll go to an ICU and um, um, I, I'll go to an ICU and you, when people are struggling, when your body's not uh, doing what it's supposed to do, uh, the bank account is sorted out, but you are struggling emotionally to deal with challenges, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you don't understand why you are waking up. So spiritually, like, you have to be solid. So physically, spiritually, emotionally, a lot of us, so, you know, we, we were taught that, you know, just work, make a lot of money, you'll be fine, mm. <laughs> right? So you make some money, but you're like, but emotionally, I'm not okay. Or suddenly, I'm thinking about stuff that happened to me as a child. Mm. So emotionally, you have to address those things. Relationally, because we are re relational people, that also needs attention. Um, then um, professionally or intellectually, what we consume, uh, what we think about, uh, that also needs attention, uh, what am I forgetting? So it's physical, oh, financial, mm. right? So we have to have some a, a healthy understanding of how we live in the world and, um, and if, if I have money, what, what do I do with it? Because sometimes you have dreams and then if you can't pick them up, it's like they have short legs. <laughs> <laughs> yep. so, you, so a balanced human being caters for those different domains in a healthy way. Mm. So you have to reflect What's the point of my life? And for me to achieve this, this purpose that God has given me, how do these different areas, how, how do I cater for them so I'm able to achieve this? Because if you neglect any of those, they affect the other ones. Sure. I love that. I love how you, you, what you're speaking of, if I'm hearing you correctly, yep. is this holistic approach, yeah. um, which has always been the very intention and desire of God for us. I mean, we see it in the Shema, right, Deuteronomy 6, where uh, we're told to love God with, with everything. Um, the fact that Jesus adds the mind uh, when he gives the great commandment is, is not like, hey, this is a new thing. This has always been the thing, that we're to love God with our heart, mind, soul, strength, with our everything. And so 
It's taking stock of that, yeah. which I think maybe sometimes we don't, um, especially as, as maybe Christians, and I know especially pastors generally don't. Like, we'll be great at making sure that we prepare the best sermons, but really horrible at taking care of ourselves physically. Yeah. Um, actually, there's a book called God's Generals, right? Mm. The subtitle goes, What They Did Right and What They Did Wrong. Mm. And there's a story of a gentleman in there. I think he came he, to plant a church in South Africa. And what happens was their house was always open and uh, they never rested, they never, people were always in the house, no balance, no, okay, now it's time for church, it's time for my family. His wife eventually uh, passed away mm. and uh, his, his kids um, got ill. Then he remarried, then he had those things and you can see the difference between his first family and his wow. second family. The, the, the other example that I think of is when Moses was busy sitting from morning till evening, mm. sorting out everybody's problems, then his father-in-law Jethro comes and says, you can't, you, you can't do it like that. Uh, pick people to help you, you know, in, in their different groups. So mm. we, we, we have to think, okay, what's the mission and how do I do it in a wise way that I don't get destroyed in the process? Then, sure. then you're not going to finish what you started. Yeah. That's so good. Um, I want to ask, you mentioned you know, trauma, you've used it a few times, uh, and then specifically you've spoken about maybe the, uh, how I grew up. How, how, how much does that play a role in our mental health in terms of um, what's happened to us historically? Because many of us will think, you know what, what happened in the past happened in the past, I'm totally fine, this is where I am now. Um, I'm, I've achieved all these things, I've got a great job, a great career, great everything. Um, do, do, do those things play a role on our mental health? And if they do, um, sh how should we be aware of them? Yeah, uh, when you asked that question, I just thought, you a wonderful question. Where do we start, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll just shorten it. Um, if we use an example. Mm. So, so the, the first two years of your life, the first three years of your life, is like the foundation of a building, mm. right? And everything else is going to be built on that. S things like, what was the pregnancy like, right? What was happening during the pregnancy and what happened even after you were born? Um, so when you are born, you are, your, your primary caregiver is bonding with you. Um, so the example, say if a child is crying, nobody picks up the child. The, the brain has to make a calculation. The brain says, oh, when I cry, nobody comes. Sure. So we have to learn not to rely on people right? Or somebody loses their mom when they are young. Or somebody, um, their mom left to work somewhere with their father or something like that. Then th the brain has to respond to this. So every event, our brain has to, has to make a conclusion. It, has, it says, this happened, so what does this mean? I don't need people, nobody will come. Then, this, this, then you carry this in your life, right? Mm -hmm. So late in life, you, you're trying to do everything. Why? Because at the back of your mind, someone says, hey, nobody will help you. Mm. So, so if we don't interrogate, like, how did I grow up? Um, how did that affect me? So we think of the past, not to think of the past, but to, to draw lessons, to say, maybe I got some lessons that are not useful from that event. Sure. How do I take a, how do I get a, a, a better lesson from it? Mm. So our past does shape us in that it's got remnants of, um, ideas, principles we've, we've kind of taken from there. So the things that happen to us, we tell ourselves stories about them. And all of us build our lives on those stories. Mm. There's no food in the house. I'm gonna work and work and work. My fridge will always be full. Mm. You see, now you're an adult, but actually what you're exercising is something you experience as a child, mm. right? So if we don't interrogate how did I grow up, the legacies, um, what was helpful, what was unhelpful. So we, we think about, and that's what therapy is, to reflecting on things that I went through um, so that I can draw the right lessons mm. to help me in the future. A lot of us are stuck because we told ourselves something which helped us, but that same thing that helped us starts becoming a problem later in life. Mm. Yeah. Mm. What, what are the, look, we live in South Africa, so let's chat a little bit about that. What, what are the, if I can phrase it this way, what are the trauma levels of, of South Africa? Like, um, maybe just from your experience, from the people that you've um, seen and, and spent time with? Uh, very high, uh, very high. I, I even think that um, 
to some degree, uh, many of us have some level of post-traumatic stress. Sure. Things like crime. Um, when you walk in the street, um, there's, a, there's, there's a way your, your body responds, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that, but that's, that's trauma. That's, I know something about this, I'm not safe. So, so you have to respond in a particular way. You, the way you grab your bag, the way you drive, the way you walk when you go in certain areas. You walk one way in the mall, you go to a different location, you change how you walk. <laughs> <laughs> so th th these things uh, we, we know, so we feel unsafe. Um, so th there's some degree of very, um, we are concerned about say safety. Yeah. And then of course they are like now, like trauma, trauma is in um, we've been, our house was taken. Mm. I remember people coming to my house, they took out stuff in the house. I remember I was bitten by a dog. I remember um, there were fights. Um, I remember um, the children are in the, th these abuse, different forms of abuse, right? Mm. Uh, GBV and things like that. And, and all those things uh, live with us. And so there's a lot of that, but we never think about it, but you see it in the way we operate. Uh, uh, an example, you're sitting in therapy, a couple comes in and the husband says, um, I'm tired, um, I'm tired, why? Why are you tired? No, uh, yesterday I came back at seven o'clock and my wife had locked the door. Oh, why did she lock the door? No, he's supposed to come back home early. <laughs> why is he supposed to come back early? No, it was late, what's late? Four o'clock, you know, five o'clock, that's late. How did you grow up? No, Around four, when I was young, my mom used to lock the gates. Sure. She used to lock the gates because, um, you know, maybe she had anxiety or there was crime or whatever. Her grandmother used to do that. <laughs> so now, we, we married here and then you are locking the door. Where, where does this, <laughs> where does this come from, right? And and part of it is is so so it's it's stuff there at the back of the mind that we don't think of, but it's the way. We behave, you know. Um, Granny is very spiritual, mm. but maybe she lost some kids when she was young, mm. and and so so th there is that level of trauma. So the the crime, the violence, um, the lack of food, uh, growing up hungry. Um, some of us like very nice clothes, very expensive clothes, and part of it is because we had to share. Mm. I had to share with my siblings. Um, I, have, I, I wanna buy a mansion, you know, I, I met a friend, my friend used to say, when I grew up, uh, my dream was to have a big bed. A big bed with big pillows. Because mm. <laughs> uh, he, he had, um, um, is it milli -mil sex yeah. for pillows. So even our dreams, if you think about why, why do I want this thing? If you think about it, trauma from... Sure. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> this, is, this, this goes deeper than I actually thought yeah. it, it does. Um, man, I, okay. Uh, let, you know, we could list a number of things that many of us have gone through, um, but there's one that I believe every single one of us ha has had to navigate uh, at some point, and, uh, and that's death, um, the death of a loved one. Um, how, how, how does that impact us? Um, and... And, and I think for many of us, I mean, I, I've shared this story numerous times, losing my dad at the age of 13 and um, trying to make sense of it. And, and so sometimes some people will, will shove it down and continue with life, um, and that later impacts you. Some, some people will deal with it then, but maybe aren't dealing with it in the most uh, helpful way. So, so maybe talk to us a little bit about, about death, what that does to us, and, um, and, and what we can do. Um, yeah. Um, it's a very important question. I, th I think death changes you. Um, uh, it, it actually changes you. Um, an image, I remember uh, somebody had put up, a, which was a workshop on death. So somebody, the, the presenter put up a picture and then it was a heart, but it had stitches. Mm. And then and she says, but this is what recovery looks like. You recover, but you don't go back to the way you were, right? Mm. And so death does change us. The second thing is that is because many of us are ill-prepared for it. Like we don't talk about it enough. It's like a taboo subject. So when it happens, we, we, we're not sure how to respond. So I think we have to, our death education, we have to talk about it, what, happen, what happens afterwards. Then when we're grieving, it affects different areas of your life. One, grief will affect you physically. So people generally feel, I feel tired, um, my, my body, I'm just, 
I don't have energy, right? Death will affect that. Secondly, um, as you grieve, it will affect your emotionally. Uh, and the two prominent emotions would be um, anger and um, sort of like guilt, some inappropriate guilt. I could have done this, I could have done that. If I did this, things would have been better, I could have done this. Uh, then death also affects us, our behavior. Uh, people do um, things that maybe may seem strange. So um, dad had a favorite chair, so I'm gonna sit in that chair. They had a favorite item, that's my item now. Mm. Uh, don't walk in their room, don't touch this, don't touch this. So it affects how we deal with that. It affects also our spiritual life. So it's then either we go, become very close um, to the Lord or become very distant. Mm. Um, because it's the one thing that I find that a lot of people say, but God, if you let this thing happen, I can't trust you. Mm. And then people walk away from that. And so, um, but most people usually adjust after six months uh, to two years. And we say we don't, the aim is not to forget. The aim is to integrate the, the loss, sure. right? So, so when you say you are fine, what we mean is you do think about what happened, but it's not as crushing as it, it, it felt when you, mm. when it, it, it happened. So then people adjust and then it comes in waves, anniversaries, celebrations, big moments in your life. You, you'd always think, oh, but I wish, I wish this person was here. I wish, you know, this was different. So it's something, so we, we carry it. It's sort of like um, you get a bag filled with stones and as you carry it, it's heavy. But with time, the, the bag doesn't change. You, you learn to carry the, the weight of the bag. Sure. So that's, that's what healing looks like. Yeah. Sure. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, maybe let's talk a little bit about, um, and all of this is, is going to uh, kind of a, a pinnacle question that I'll ask. Um, uh, some folks in here are, ma are married. Um, what, what are some of the kind of the, the, the big things that you've seen um, that affect marriages? Um, and and again, remember, we're still talking about like just mental well-being and, and how that impacts um, our, our everything, our entire, you know, it's ho so holistic. What, what, are some, what are some things that uh, some married people should be on the lookout for? Um, One of my favorite topics, how much time do you have? No, I'll keep it to three points. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for me, um, I th what I find, the, the, the one thing we have to correct when, when we work with couples is that um, what, what people miss is so, as a human being, we all have a story. We have like a love map. This is how I grew up, and this is how I, this is how I was parented. So, tell me how you're raised, and I'll tell you how you love. Do we say that again? That's so good. Say yeah. that again. <laughs> so tell me how you were raised, and I'll tell you how you love. Because if, say, for example, one parent wasn't present, and you didn't have the attention, then we tend to seek that in our spouses, mm. right? Which we're not mindful of it too, but the tracks of love are based on how we were loved, mm. right? So when people date, one of the first, one of the things you'd like is, were you loved? <laughs> That's what you wanna know, right? <laughs> were you loved? Mm. Uh, so, so how we were raised, how we were parented, that now creates this love map we have. Mm. So we come up with our own love maps. I have what love is like. I mean, I got it from my mom, I got it from my dad, I got it from Disney, you know, <laughs> I, I got it from songs, I got it from movies, but I, I've got this idea. Then I meet someone else, and men and women have their own journeys, story for another day. Then I meet someone else, and they have their love map. And then we struggle to, to communicate then I want you to see it the way that I see it. And I'm expecting, so, so, so couples, one, they struggle with it. They struggle with what we call a, th a theory of mind, right? The ability to kind of understand where my partner is coming from. Mm. Once we can sort that out, to say, learn to understand that your partner is not being malicious, but they just have a certain idea. Understand that and then talk to them from that perspective. Mm. So that's the one. Then the, the other one, it's sort of how we learn to, with mental health, the, the, the relationship. So the relationships are important. Um, how we learn to relate. Um, an example would be um, somebody grows up in a house where this is how we deal with conflict. Something went wrong, and in my house, the one who shouts the loudest wins. 
right? Mm. So you shout, you shout, I shout back. If I'm the loudest, I won. Mm. Then I marry somebody else, where in their house, in their home, a conflict worked like this. Something happens and then we apologize, we address it. Then these two people get married and then we have a misunderstanding. I'm, I'm fixing for a fight, right? You shout, I need to shout, <laughs> and then you apologize. And then we have a problem. So things like, so understanding the state of mind, understanding um, that how to deal with very intense emotions, very difficult situations. Then I'll say that, then the last one I'll say is what we base uh, the marriage on. Mm. And then it's, it's beautiful that you are in this space. When it's a covenant, it's, it, it's you know, a godly marriage. I, I find they survive more. Mm. Because it's not about you or me, but um, this this message that we are doing. It's not your way or my way. Like we're doing it in God's way, right? Mm. And and so people who like, if you base it on other things, uh, the way somebody looks, what they have, their name, their family, whether they are nice to you, what they did, what they didn't do, then you struggle. But if you enter marriage, and it's the ideas that we. So with mental health is the ideas, the stories of, so the, the idea that you have about marriage mm. will affect how you then relate with your spouse. Mm. It's good. What, why is there a higher rate of depression right now? Um, we, we are building a world that we can't live in. Um, wait, wait, what? Wait. <laughs> wait, okay, wait, say, say that again and then unpack it. We, we are what? Yeah, <laughs> we are building a world that we, we can't live in. Right, where okay. a lot of people feel being here now, I'd rather exit. Sure. Right, we, we are in spaces where we, we can't speak freely. We will say, there are things I can say here, there are things I'll think for myself. Mm. So we are not living um, an authentic, we don't have authentic relationships, mm. right? And the world we build, the world we are building is for individuals. But we know human beings are social creatures, yeah. right? And, and so a lot of us, I, I like what you said, uh, you said that the series was, you are not alone. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are alone. And that's why we're becoming very, very depressed. Um, we, we are alone and then we compare ourselves with other people on the other side of our screens. We look at what they have, we look at what they are saying, we look at what they edited, we look at and then we look at ourselves and we think there's something wrong. But, um, but because we don't relate enough, we don't have people to connect with properly. Mm. Um, because we're we, 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 we supposed to face challenges, that's part of life. But the remedy for it is that it's other human beings who help us go from moment to moment to moment. So we don't have a lot of that. Mm. And so a lot of people live isolated lives and then they don't, we pursue the wrong things, and then we don't have the relationships that buffer against that, so we become depressed. You, I, love, I love what you're saying. Um, we say here at Rooted Fellowship, um, we were never created to live in isolation. We were beautifully designed for fellowship. Yeah. Um, and it speaks of this, this idea of community. Um, and, uh, and you kind of alluded to, and you probably said it, uh, you know, friendships, why, why they matter, you know, brothers and sisters, why it matters. And so what should I be, well, firstly, how important, and I you already answered it, so that will be a short answer, but how important are good friendships for my mental well-being? That's one. And then what, what should I be looking for in that friendship or in those friendships? Like what, because you're right, like I think we do a lot of pretending and performing. I, I don't just say it because like, I have nothing else to say. I say it because it's true. And sometimes I catch myself doing it, right? But, but what, what is a, a great relationship where I'm going, and this is going to be really good for my mental well-being? Um, th there was a study that said um, um, husbands who kiss their wives goodbye live five times longer. <laughs> five, five years longer than, than the other. Let's, let's just let that one sink in a little bit. Let's just let, <laughs> let's just. Yeah, wow. hus yeah. Um, husbands who kiss their wives before they go to work live five years longer. But I don't think it's about the kiss itself. It's about, because it, a kiss tells you about the nature of the relationship, mm. right? So the closer we are, the more affectionate we are. And so, like, so people who have relationships live longer. In fact, this is how I knew I was gonna get married. I was doing psychology. <laughs> 
He's got a word for someone. <laughs> I was, I, was, I was in my psychology, uh, I was, it was undergrad, I was reading a textbook and then we were reading Who Gets Depressed? And it was saying single, single, single. I was like, no. I was like, no. I was like, no. Uh, the, longest, uh, the longest study in, in, in history, I think it's a Harvard history, uh, the professors brought that book, A Good Life. Mm -hmm. And they asked what makes a good life and it's relationships. Mm. So relationships are immense for our survival. There are psychology experiments with that, uh, where they've proved um, they got um, kids to kids who were just fed, not picked up, mm. very unethical things that they wouldn't do now. But the ones who thrived were, were the ones who had relationships. So relationships, we can't not have relationships. Mm. What are the good ones? The, the good ones are the authentic ones where the people, where we feel, where we connect, where we are honest, where we are vulnerable, because that's what we bond in. A good relationship is where I can be myself and I'm not judged, right? I can be held and I can be challenged. Mm. And a good relationship is when, when I'm not perfect and somebody's able to hear me out, um, embrace me mm. and work with me. Those are the relationships. Um, and many of us don't have people to trust yeah, uh, especially the men. Most men don't have friends. Talk, 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 talk about that. Like, go a little bit deeper there. Yeah, most men don't have friends because um, partly um, because it's what we pursue, right? We pursue competence. Mm. We want to be good at um, things. And then we, we lead with our logic. And then the, the intimate partners we have is usually our partners. And um, then once your, if your partner leaves or she's not available, then you, you, we struggle. You don't even visit your own parents if the wife doesn't say, let's go home. <laughs> you understand? So, um, so we, relationships are, um, are, are very important. And with men, if we don't, because we want to be so good, at, we lean into you see, this dead box, I'm gonna make money, and then we neglect the, let me relate with my family, let me relate with my friends, let me invest in the relationships, because we are pursuing being great. Mm. But then it comes at a price. As we build, um, we are going that way, but the stuff that's happening at the back is falling apart. Mm. And, and so we need to remember that, to remember that I, I, I need to work, but I need to bond with people. Mm. And, um, and I also need to be, because I want to be competent, I'm, I'm afraid mm. to not be good, so I'm afraid to open up to my partner. And sometimes also if you open up to your partner and your partner in, in the heat of the moment says, yeah, you're just like your father. And, and then you learn, then you learn I'll never, I will never tell her because we don't like to be shamed, right? So a lot of men struggle with shame. And if you risk telling friends, telling somebody, something you're struggling with, instead of cherishing it, they attack you, they embarrass you, then you learn, like most men, you say, this world is not kind. This world's not kind to a man, especially a broke man. I can't rely on anyone, <laughs> right? I can't rely on anyone. I can rely on myself. And then we struggle. And when we struggle, we can't tell anyone. We think, let me just get out. It, you, you, yeah, man, you've, um, so you've brought something quite important to the surface. And, um, and this isn't just a, a male issue, and so maybe speak first holistically about it, and then and then double click on it. So, we're seeing a lot of um, death by suicide um, in our town, uh, in our schools, in our communities, in our families. Um, it, it's almost like a week doesn't go by and I hear about it, and um, and many of us, we, I mean, it's close to home uh, for some. What, I mean, you've you've spoken quite a bit about just the issues in our society and how it can, like we can actually trace it and go, okay, that's why. But, but maybe talk a little bit about it holistically and, and let's talk about it in South Africa. And then on top of that, because you raised the issue of men, um, there is this, a higher rate of, of death by suicide by, by, by men. And you were saying, we we're chatting a little bit and you are saying uh, women actually attempt it more, but it's because the men, it's higher for men because they, they succeed in terms of, and I hate that word succeed, but yeah. Um, 
So, so maybe t talk, yeah, talk yeah. to us about that. Like I mean, what, what's going on? It's a, it's a huge problem. Um, so women are tempted more um, because women lead with their emotions and like it's, it's not bad, it's good for, for intimacy. So women are tempted more, but it's the methods they use. I don't want to give anyone ideas. <laughs> Please don't. Yeah, but men, 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 I don't want to say successful, but men, men are effective at it, for, for lack of a better description, because of the methods men use. Mm. Knives, guns, driving in front of a car, like very drastic, so if a man's gonna do something, he's gonna do it, right? So use very drastic, and, and part of it is, at the, the essence of suicide has to do with, I feel burdened. I feel burdened by the weight of life. And it's not that I actually want to die, I actually just want to stop feeling what I'm feeling. And I'm hopeless. I'm feeling what I'm feeling, and when I look at tomorrow, I don't see how this thing is going to change. And so what's the point? And so if then, if, if, if I did leave this place, then I will rest. So it's when people say things, and we miss it when people say things like, I'm tired. So what do you mean, right? Yeah. Um, I'm tired, I work somewhere and there was a gentleman, every time he had that somebody passed away, he'd say, oh, that person has rested. And the, the gentleman eventually um, hung himself. So, um, so it's, it's a, it's a, suicide happens because a lot of people feel burdened. So we don't have the relationships to sustain uh, when people are struggling. Um, in men in particular, it would be because, say, the economy. So I'm not doing well, I feel useless, What's the point? So let me do this. With women, it's more relational. My relationships are not healthy. My partner, I'm not healthy with my parents, with my children, with my partner. And so then we think about that. Then the rest of us, m we miss the signs. Somebody who's never really told you that they love you, all of a sudden they say stuff like, I love you so much, you know, I, I love you so much. You even think, what's, what's wrong with you? People start giving away, they are precious things oh they'll say things like but if i if i if something happened to me would you miss me and and because we are afraid to talk about it mm -hmm. and so that's partly what that's partly what happens with uh, a lot of people feeling very bad and, and if uh, there was a prof who, who passed away in uct and um famous prof known everywhere and the story afterwards was that um there was a history in the family and then he, he, he had so many responsibilities, he asked to be relieved, and they said, no, but you're fine. Uh, just, you're so great, just, just do it. So I think the more we have honest conversations, when people are struggling, we, we make time for them, and we let people become more vulnerable. And when somebody's struggling, we help them. Uh, we, we actually help them, then people actually uh, feel better. Oh, then the last thing, um, with, with suicide, so, when we were learning, uh, so the, the, here's the exercise. Say if you find somebody on a bridge and they say they're going to jump, what do you say to them? Don't jump, which is the wrong answer. So a lot of us will say, don't jump, you have kids, you have a lot to live for. <laughs> <laughs> but at, then if you say that, then the person says, I'm going to jump. Because what they want is, I want you to hear me. So if you don't hear me, I have to crank it up. I have to do something for you to hear me. And so when somebody is on the ledge, metaphorically, we want to say, we see that you're struggling. What's going on? So this is us taking a drive, saying, hey, man, I haven't seen you in a while. What's up? What's happening? Let's have a coffee. Uh, but you said something that was a bit strange. Hey, let's meet. That's making time for each other to hear a person. Normally, when I've met very suicidal people, once you talk to them, they feel, Oh, you get it. Then, this, then I don't need to go that route. Yeah, yeah I mean that's <clears throat> that's why I, I purposefully called the the series "You Are Not Alone," um, and you know you talk you used the word. I mean, I heard it. Feel, 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 and there's a feeling that eventually leads to a doing, yeah. um, and I I don't want any of you to do that. And, and so how do I take hold of those feelings? I mean, the, the, the Bible's clear on it. There's, um, I'm sure you have tons of you know, tools, and, and, 
But then it always comes back to what were you thinking? Mm. Like, what, what were you thinking? And, and I mean, we spend so much, the person that you spend the most time with is you. You think about that for a moment. The person you listen to the most is you. So what are you thinking? What are you telling yourself? And, and, and the reason I'm, I'm talking here a little bit is because, is um, and so, I mean, everyone look at me, um, and particularly the men, look at me. Man, please, please, if you need to speak to someone, come chat to me. If you feel uncomfortable chatting to me, there's tons of amazing individuals here that we, we want to talk to you. We want to walk with you. We want to hear you. And, and the, you'll be blown away by the reality of like, hey, you are not alone. That thing that you are experiencing, the thing that you are feeling, the thing that you are thinking about, I'm not a good enough husband. I'm not a good enough father. I'm not, I'm not doing enough. I'm not making enough. I'm, and the weight of that responsibility. Ladies, the weight, of, the responsibility that you all carry, you are not alone. And so I... I yeah, I, I just, when I talk about death by suicide and how, how many of, like it's, for many of us, it's personal because there's people we know, there are things that, that, that even those who are left behind wrestle with. I have a good friend of mine who once said this to me, he said, hey, listen, don't you ever, ever, ever think about doing that. And he gave a bunch of reasons and, and he says, man, I don't care what it is, you pick up the phone and you phone me, you have someone like that in your life where you just say, I'm not, I'm not doing well, and they, they, it's almost like they already know something's not up, like something's not right, and then where are you? Sit, put, I'm on my way. You have someone like that in your life. So I, I just wanted to, like as you're saying it, I just I felt that weight of, um, just of what we carry. I think that's important because um, I want to say, I think the, the lie that we, we all have to deal with or get removed from our minds is the idea that I and only I am experiencing this and nobody will understand, right? And so someone will understand and so, but we have to be willing to risk. Yeah. Um, we have to be willing to risk. It's like in marriage, you say, but if you didn't say it, the thing doesn't exist. It exists in your head, right? And so if you are struggling, we, we want to, this person might not understand, this one might not understand, but this one will. Mm. But we have to risk sharing what we yeah. feel and it's struggling with. It's good. We're almost done. Maybe one or two more. Um, having said all that you've said, yeah. and looking at all the different things, and we could have gone even deeper and given further, when do I know I need to go see a therapist? Like, what, if I'm sitting here and I'm hearing you and I'm like, mm, okay, and I'm maybe doing some self-evaluation, and like, when is that time to, because there are things that I can, you know, I can chat to a friend, you know, I can, I can change something to get a little bit more balance, but, but then there are times where it's like, I actually need to go see a professional. When is that? Yeah, when you, um, so it goes back to, when you are struggling to meet your, you have goals, but you can't achieve those goals. So, so this is what people normally do. They wait when it's a crisis to go see a professional. Sometimes you see a professional for what we call personal development, right? You say, there are things I'd like to do, but somehow I'm struggling to, I've got, a, I'm, I've got these things I want to do, but I, I can't achieve what I'm struggling to do. Talk to a professional then. Then you are, it's early stages, right? And then they, you talk to a professional when there's a crisis. You are overwhelmed, uh, you are struggling, you don't know what you're doing. Then we, 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 we manage that. You also talk to a, 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 a therapist after the fact. You went through something difficult, and, um, but you want to make sense of it. Remember, every event we go through, there's, there's what we tell ourselves about it. So you want to tell yourself the right things mm -hmm. about it. But generally, the, the typical example is, when you are just, you have to have, I'm going back to, you have to have a base. When, um, when you feel that uh, I'm struggling with something, I spoke with people I know, but I'm still struggling, then talk to a professional. And sometimes then there are people we must ask to see a professional mm. because they either, remember we all have blind spots. Sometimes we think we're fine, but it's fair to say, hey, lately you're a bit irritable. So take feedback as well. Hey, lately you are, 
you know, you're not so nice, or you're withdrawn, or so. Also, when you hear things like that, talk to a professional. Yeah. yeah. I heard someone use this example once, and I thought it was super helpful. Um, depending on uh, how obedient you are to this, uh, but most of us in here who you know have vehicles, yeah. and you take your vehicle in regularly for yeah, a service, for service yeah. right? It gets to a particular mileage, or it gets to a particular date, and you go, you know what? The responsible thing to do is to take this car in to be serviced. And, uh, and he said to me, it's interesting that we do that with you know, this piece of metal, but we don't do that with our, our own bodies and our own minds. And so I think it would be wise just to, hey, I feel great, things are good, but you know what, I think it's that time. I just wanna just go chat with someone, and, and who knows, maybe something might come up, maybe nothing. Maybe it's like, hey, you're fantastic, this is great. And hopefully you're seeing someone who's not gonna make up stuff just so that they can see you again. <laughs> And make some money, but 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 I think it's healthy to to do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I got one last question, then I'm done. But I want to give you uh, just an opportunity. Is there anything that you feel like, hey, I'd love to share this? Um, uh, yeah. Anything on your heart and your mind for us uh, in this on this particular um, kind of area of of mental health? Um. I, for me, I think the important thing to when you work with people and you are busy peering in people's souls, right? What you notice is we, we, the, the story you tell yourself is very important mm. because that's what your life is going to be based on. And part of the stories we get because other people told us things, right? And so uh, then we have to relearn things. We have to get the right perspective, mm. right? And then I would say an eternal perspective is better than my emotional perspective. Good. What, what, is, what does God think about what I'm going through in my life to, to get that perspective as opposed to see, but I feel this and I think that. Mm. Because I feel this and I think that is stuff we got from where we grew up, what we experienced, what we read, right? So then we, we, we search. So for me, the, the, it, it begins with what we accept. Whatever you accept, your life is going to then reflect that. Mm. And so if I could say one thing is that we have to be reflective. We have to take the time to kind of say, but why do I believe the things that I believe? Mm. Right? And is it, is it something I was taught? Is it something um, I got somewhere? We get, that, we get things from our parents because they have to help us to a certain stage. Some of them are useful. Um, some of the, uh, how we are parented sometimes is useful, sometimes it's not useful. Mm. Sometimes it was useful then, but maybe needs to be upgraded, right? Mm. So, but, so what we have to do is watch the story and reflect on the story. That's good. Reflect, reflect, reflect on the story. It's very good, very good. My last question, and um, the band can come up as, uh, as we close out, is um, how, how can the church and the, you know, for lack of a better phrase, the clinical psychologist world work better together? Um, if we say, you know, God, God's sovereign over everything, so God can heal through miracles and God can heal through medicine, he can heal through prayers and he can heal through pills, um, how can the church and, and uh, the clinical psychology world work better together? Yeah, I, I think you see what you're doing here is, is, is good. So one, I think there's, there's a misunderstanding of, actually, when I hear people talk about mental health, like sometimes I go, no, but that's not, that's not what it is. You know, they Googled something. The, so the one is to let, let's know, okay, what are we, what, what, what does a psychologist actually do, right? And then there are, there are things that are, so as a Christian I'll say there are things that are helpful and then there are things that are not helpful in terms of ideas and, and things like that, the ideas that you might be taught, some are not biblical. But essentially to know that there's nothing wrong in learning to reflect. Mm. And essentially that's what you are doing in counseling. You are reflecting and then having a better perspective. Nobody's telling you what to do. They kind of say, think about what you, have you thought, think about it that way. And then because things are created twice, right? Mm. In, in the spiritual world and then physically. So we have to, the more we think about things then we don't have to experiment outside. So take time to, 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 to think about that. Then uh, two, um, I, I think what's good about, um, church is that we actually get to work, we renew our minds. That's good. We get to be, you come, you learn, you get challenged, you are thinking about it, um, and then to not be afraid to teach 
about why Judas would do what he did mm. after he betrayed the Lord. To, to not be afraid to talk about the difficult, your tamas, mm. right? To not shy away from those sermons because we have modern day tamas, mm. right? But we, we, you don't hear that a lot. About, so for the church, not be afraid. And then when we hear in church that something, something has happened and somebody has gone through something, to say, no, hush, 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 don't. Mm. To not hide things, but to, to be genuine and to be authentic okay. so that the people can have a real relationship with the Lord, with themselves, and with each other. Mm. I think that's how, once, once we do that, and then where we struggle, where we need help, then we talk together. We say, I think biblically this is what it means but here, they're like, there's a specific trauma and you need specific skills. Biblically, this is what it means. Uh, we, we counsel you um, spiritually, but then there are specific tools, uh, tools and skills you need for this anxiety. Mm. This, so, so that's how we can work together. And then the last one, just for pastors to not say, you don't need a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best to not do that again. Okay. Sorry. No, no that's, thank you very much. That's super helpful. Guys, can we give um, Tabang? Um, Yo, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much. I, I, I have tremendous respect for, for you and for many of your colleagues who are uh, in this space. You serve us uh, in, in such an important way. I'm very, very thankful. And um, I'll say it up front um, because I'm up front and I have the mic on. I'm particularly thankful for you because uh, not only do you love the Lord, not only are you um, a professional uh, clinical psychologist, but but being a black male is, is something pretty significant. Um, I searched really, really hard uh, to find one, and, it's, and not to say that other ethnicities don't matter, but, but there's, there's something here that we can talk about uh, that allows us to go a little bit deeper, and so I'm thankful for that, and I'm praying that God would uh, bless you, um, that God would continue to open doors for you, and that you would continue to be uh, just a blessing to other people as you serve them in, uh, in what you're doing and how God has beautifully designed you, and so thank you for you, your family. Mm. Um, yeah, so just again, uh, Thank you. what we're going to do is, um, uh, I'm going to have you, you know, transition to sit down. We're going to sing in a moment. Um, oh, thanks. Let me grab that. Yeah, you can. What I'm going to, I said to him, what do I do? Do I, uh, do I hand you a business card out? And, and, and um, he said, no, please don't do that. Uh, but, but we're going to, uh, we're going to get his details out to you guys. I think what we're going to do is we're going to, on our website, create, uh, we've got a resource page there that needs to be updated. And so uh, what we're going to do is we'll have your information and various other uh, folks' information, uh, just so that you have resources, uh, things to read, things to know, uh, and then places to go um, if, you, if you need to see someone. Uh, and so his information will be there as well. And so if you want to chat more, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, but let me, let me close out uh, by reading a passage that we went through last week, Sunday, and then we're going to stand and we're going to respond. Um, there's various ways that we could respond to all of this. Um, they really are. We could be super somber about it and, uh, and just have a time of prayer and we bring out the anointing oil and we just, we, we pray over you. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Um, you know, we could talk about it more, you know, unpack it, maybe break up into smaller groups. There's, there's that way of doing it as well. Um, but I also think that it's appropriate uh, to respond in praise as well. Uh, even when we talk about uh, things like this, we can sometimes feel like there's no space for us to praise. There's no space for us to uh, give thanks to God. And, and I believe, no, 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 we can. Uh, we definitely can. Especially when you read much of the New Testament, when you read a lot of Paul's writings, you'll see that he prays. You'll see that there are times where he's kind of in that state of just being somber with those around them, and he's holding their hands, and he's like, I'm here with you. And then there's moments where he says, you know what? In some situations, we just need to worship our way through it. That there are things in our lives where sometimes we just say, you know, God, I, I want to be thankful for what you have done in my life. That I can look forward and see your faithfulness and your goodness because I've looked back and I've seen that you were faithful and you were good to me. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to praise you for it. I'm going to worship my way through it. Remember, we said at the beginning of the year that worship is war. Worship is war, and, and so what we're doing is we're saying, I'm, gonna, I'm going to war with, with the things around me. I'm going to war with the, the, the thoughts that are in my head. I'm going to take captive of them, and I'm going to lay them before the, foot, the feet of Jesus, and I'm going to say, I'm just going to worship through it. And so I want to read you this so that you can see it, and then we're going to stand, and we're going to praise him, the one who is seated on the throne, the one who is fully in control. And so Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says this. Paul writes, don't worry about anything. 
but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. And it's that word thanksgiving that says, you know what, we can, we can worship through it. We can definitely worship through it. We present our requests to God and then the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so I'm gonna ask that all of us stand and I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna sing to the one who is seated on the throne who is fully in control of not just our bodies but of our minds as well. And so Father God, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you all the glory. But God, I pray for those right now who maybe are hurting, they're going through the most, they've heard all this information and and now they're, they're wondering, what does this mean for me? Do I need to seek help? Holy Spirit, would you lead them to that place where they need to be? Father God, I pray that we would take captive our thoughts. Those things that are untrue, those things that do not speak of you, those things that do not point to you. I pray against the father of lies, whose desire is to constantly whisper in our ears of things that have nothing to do with you. God, I pray that your promises would be so much louder in our lives, that we would see that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are merciful, that you are kind. And that would lead us to a place of praise that we would posture our hearts in such a way that we would say, let everything that has breath praise you. And that includes us. God, even if you have not yet changed the circumstances or the situations in our lives, Father, we can still praise you. And so help us to worship through it. That whatever we are looking for just might be on the other side of that step of obedience. And so, Father, as we take that step, let us do so with thankful hearts, with hearts that praise you and worship you and give you all the glory. And so now, God, I ask that we would sing. We'd sing our faces off. Because we know how the story ends. We know how the story ends, that one day, those who've surrendered their lives to you as Lord and Savior, we will gather around the throne and we will sing your praises. And then we'll share story after story after story, testimony after testimony after testimony of this is what I was going through, but I was able to keep my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, because he is good. Let everything that has breath praise you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray, amen.